Hi, Steve here. Hosea 4.6 says, My people perish or are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Being ignorant about history will keep you vulnerable to the lies of the enemy. And it's been one of the main reasons the enemy has been able to infiltrate the lives and minds of so many believers. It's amazing to me that the things men believe in this generation have come from men who presumed, imagined, and just outright made up a theory. This will be the third video I've done on aliens and extraterrestrials. And where did it all come from? And the one thing you know if you've watched the other two videos is that the belief in extraterrestrials didn't just start in the 21st century and it didn't originate here either. Several events happened in the 17th century which impacted the beliefs in extraterrestrial life. First, the replacement of the geocentric theory with Copernicus's heliocentric theory created a gradual groundswell and speculation regarding multiple inhabited solar systems. And secondly, the telescope was invented in 1608, so men could see the moon had mountains and what looked to be like seas and, and that other planets had moons, so that obliged the idea that Earth-like similarities meant that there had to be life on other planets. Another assumption. So they went on assuming again. And then finally during this time, a subtle undercurrent of religious occult thought added fuel to the fire. As a result, the next three centuries witnessed a rapid mushrooming of the belief in life on other planets. The Reverend John J. Cavanaugh, Professor Emeritus at the University of Notre Dame and a recognized world authority on the subject of the debate on extraterrestrial life forms, affirms that not only were astronomical technology and the heliocentric theory important contributing factors, but a supportive shift in the religious and philosophical mentality of the period was crucial. One of the first men to write about the physical appearance of aliens was Christian Huygens, 1629 to 1695. He was a Dutch physicist and astronomer who said, the world is my country, science is my religion. And he claimed to be a Protestant Christian. Huygens wrote the first work ever exclusively dedicated to the question of intelligent alien life and possible physical appearance. He said, but when we come to meddle with the shape of these creatures and consider the incredible variety that is even in those of the different parts of this earth, I must then confess that I think it beyond the force of imagination to arrive at any knowledge in the matter or reach probability concerning the figures of these planetary animals. I make no doubt but that the planetary worlds have as wonderful a variety as we. Not men perhaps like ours, but some creatures or others endued with reason." Unquote. The key words in this supposition are imagination, probability, and a whole lot more imagination. This is almost like saying men can have based on what fact or what reality absolutely none. So claiming to be a Christian, apparently he never read Acts 17.11 and 1 Thessalonians 5.21. He never examined the scriptures to see if these things were so. And he didn't test all things. In fact, he didn't test anything. He just imagined and speculated. Purely on assumption and human reason, something that all pluralists are guilty of. So in 1745, a new paradigm came along called cosmic pluralism. It was the first time in history where spiritism, extraterrestrialism, and Christianity merged into a, a new system of thought. The founder of this was a Swedish scientist, mathematician, and false prophet by the name of Emanuel Swedenborg, 1688 to 1772. He was revered by many as one of the greatest mystics of all time, and he claimed to be chosen by God to unveil the scriptures. His contact came via angels and spirits, which lived on Jupiter, Mars, Mercury, Saturn, Venus, and the moon. He said, it has been granted me of the Lord to discourse and converse with spirits and angels who are from other earths, with some for a day, with some for a week, and with some for months, and to be instructed by them concerning the earths from which and near which they were, and concerning the lives, customs, and worship of the inhabitants thereof. 
Swedenborg admitted these are the spirits by which men are possessed. Swedenborg's revelations not only resulted in the creation of a new Christianity, but also captured the attention of occultists who formed both official and unofficial Masonic rites in honor of these new teachings. Swedenborg also represents one of the cogs in the wheel of modern esotericism, a 19th and 20th century revival and repackaging of witchcraft into a new age occult movement. And today, the Exeter Center for the Study of Esotericism awards doctorates and master's degrees in Western esotericism. The course is described as including occultism, mesmerism, spiritualism, the ancient wisdom tradition, and ceremonial magic and paramasonic orders. They claim they're providing an inspiration to contemporary thinkers and practitioners in the arts, education, and medicine. The students begin with a historical survey course entitled The Western Esoteric Traditions in a compulsory core module in order to appreciate the broad scope and common features of this spirituality. When you look at this and the subjects they teach in Hermeticism, Rosicrucianism, Freemasonry, Romantic Natural Science, and Modern Esotericism, you see that it's really all about the occult. The Blavatsky Trust, the primary sponsor of the doctorate program, says their objective is to promote study and research in the field of the laws of nature and of the powers latent in man. That's the occult and witchcraft in a nutshell. The Philosophical Society is a grooming ground for elitists who promote antichrist philosophies. Their logo uses the Ouroboros, the serpent biting its tail, and the hexagram star symbol the telltale signs of its real spiritual roots. Emanuel Swedenborg was one of the first mystics to claim contact with beings from another world. His endorsement of extraterrestrial life and the incorporation of the belief that a metaphysical religious system helped revive its true connections with the ancient gods and mystery religions. By the 19th, 20th, and 21st century, the occult elitists recognized this is a system of wisdom comfortable to their objectives, and it helped shape the modern concept that aliens are beings which impart advanced, higher knowledge. Such wisdom doesn't come down from above, but it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. It's nearly impossible to separate alienism and the ufology of occult overtones. Some of the prominent men of the 1700s, like Voltaire, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Wright, Immanuel Kant, Johann Lambert, David Rittenhouse, John Adams, Thomas Paine, and Sir William Herschel contributed much to the growth of pluralism. We need to remember that much of the modern science is founded on the Greek philosophical school of naturalism. So to go from one field to the next, philosophy to astronomy, is not saying a whole lot. The change had more to do with its perception and general acceptance than with any real physical evidence. The reality is, the philosophers of the ancient past became the scientists of the present. No 18th century scientist had ever seen an alien, but that didn't stop them from having faith in their reality. In the early 1800s, a new series of books were published that went a long way to helping establish extraterrestrial life in the minds of many Christians. Yes, Christians have been programmed and brainwashed just like the rest of the world especially those who don't know the Word of God. A Presbyterian minister named Thomas Chalmers, 1780-1847, was called Scotland's greatest 19th century churchman. Like many men before him and after, he assumed that the supposed existence of similar Earth-like solar systems indicated life was equally peppered throughout the universe. And just like the men that propagated this lie through assumption and suppositions, he fell in right along with them. Joseph Smith, the founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, better known as Mormons, was undoubtedly influenced by the growing social belief in extraterrestrial life. When you couple that with his upbringing in witchcraft and his interest in Freemasonry, he was able to form one of the largest Christian cults in the history of the world. Just like Emanuel Swedenborg 85 years prior, Joseph Smith merged the three ideologies into a new Christian religion, which was no more Christian than my sweat socks. Mormonism's God is an exalted sinner who ascended above the heights of the clouds after becoming like the Most High. Hmm, sounds like Isaiah 1414. 
and the description of Lucifer. Next, only to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church of the Latter-day Saints cling to one of the world's most perverted forms of Christianity. It's a masterpiece of demonic crafting being nothing more than blatant occult doctrine, cloaked in an aura of Jesus, God, and family values. It's really hard to find a better example of satanic deception than this cult. How was Smith able to steal Christianity and turn it into a spiritual monstrosity this blasphemous? All you have to do is understand the ancient secrets hidden with masonry and how that philosophy came to bear on the professing Christian public of the 1800s. Between 1720 and 1835, the Holy Spirit was sweeping through America through two great awakenings, and these revivals produced hundreds of thousands of born-again Christians like John Wesley, George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, Charles Finney, and Peter Cartwright. But of course, Satan was right there to sow tares among the wheat. The way the devil did that is through the guise of a seemingly benevolent fraternity known as Freemasonry. It was easy to fool the Christians who were not rooted and grounded in the Word of God. Freemasonry really started to grow in America in the early 1730s, and they used secret handshakes, tokens, and rituals to teach their secret doctrines. The curiosity of these secrets and the possibility of economic and political success and advancement drew many to join them. And because the so-called craft used the King James Bible in its rituals, many wrongly assumed that it was compatible with Christian doctrine. It wasn't. Like Isaiah 4, 6 says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. Freemasonry's secret doctrine was the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, a belief that revered the gods and teachings of all faiths and sought to unite them all under the fraternal umbrella of masonry. So much of it sounded so right, but unfortunately, their ignorance resulted in whole generations of Christian men and women becoming desensitized to the occult. Such a ridiculous and profound lack of spiritual understanding proved that Bibles weren't being believed or read or the sermons weren't being preached or listened to. Pastors dropping the ball and professing Christians allowed occult philosophy to make inroads into society and the political founding of America. This also helped lay the groundwork for New Age philosophy in America. Masonry had been in America for nearly a century when the Mormon church was birthed in 1830. Mormonism was the perfect hodgepodge of extraterrestrialism, Masonism, occultism, and Christianity. Its profession of polytheism was able to slide hand in glove with the secret mysteries taught by the Lodge. It had many things in common with Emanuel Swedenborg's church founded 100 years earlier. Both founders were involved in some form of witchcraft or mysticism. Both religions were based on false angelic revelation. Both felt of God to spread a new Christianity. Both espoused extraterrestrial life as gospel truth. And both systems grabbed the attention of occultists and Freemasons. All of this fall into deception could have been avoided if they would have just read and believed the Bible. Like the Apostle Paul said, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, let him be cursed. The speculations and false claims continued by men devoid of any real faith in the Bible. William Herschel, an astronomer and telescope engineer and a strong proponent of pluralism, affirmed that the possibility of lunar inhabitants was an almost absolute certainty." Unquote. He claimed that a variety of intelligent creatures had been spotted on the moon, one of which was scientifically dubbed Vespertilio Homo, or the Man Bat. Running parallel to the mid-1800s with growing acceptance of alien life was the emerging phenomenon of spiritism or spiritualism. It consisted of things like automatic writing, mediumship, clairvoyance, psychic abilities, seances, mesmerism, hypnotism, and channeling. Spiritism is based primarily around necromancy or communication with the dead. Modern Spiritism traces its roots back to 1848 in Hydeville, New York, where three sisters, Leah, Margareta, and Kate Fox, are said to have communicated with the spirit of a murdered salesman calling itself Splitfoot. Contact was made by rapping on wood. This is how the term poltergeist evolved, where noisy ghosts from the German poltern to make a racket and geist, which means ghost. 
The Fox sisters may be revered as the pioneers of the modern religion, but spiritist loyalists say that it was Emanuel Swedenborg back in the 16 and 1700s along with Franz Anton Mesmer, Charles Fourier, and Andrew Jackson Davis as the true forefathers. Spiritism became popular in America in the last quarter of the 19th century, probably because of people trying to reestablish contact with loved ones that were lost during the Civil War. But you can't make contact with lost ones. Only demons will convince you that you're talking to your loved ones because they were there when they were alive on this earth and they witnessed their lives. The most notable example would be when Mary Todd Lincoln, the president's wife, attempted to contact her son, William, by having numerous seances while living in the White House. Just like the belief in extraterrestrial life, necromancy has ancient roots as well. The Bible condemns necromancy as an evil sin. That's why the life of King Saul was ended for observing it. Believe it or not, Lynn E. Cato, former senior bibliographer for the Library of Congress, said in her 1969 report compiled for the U.S. Air Force Office of Scientific Research. She wrote, a large part of the available UFO literature is closely linked with mysticism and the metaphysical. It deals with subjects like mental telepathy, automatic writing, and invisible entities, as well as phenomena like poltergeist manifestations and possession. Many of the UFO reports now being published in the popular press recount alleged incidents that are strikingly similar to demonic possession and psychic phenomenon, which have long been known to theologians and parapsychologists. Even an agnostic by the name of John Keel came to the same general conclusion in his book UFOs, Operation Trojan Horse, published the following year in 1970. He said, the connections are no accident, however, and they serve to help demonstrate that the gods and spirits of old form the true basis for the belief in intelligent life on other planets. Cardinal John Henry Newman, 1801 to 1890, highly lauded ex-Calvinist turned Roman Catholic said, it almost amounts to blasphemy to doubt the plurality of worlds. And Ellen G. White, the founder of the Seventh-day Adventists, who proclaimed the sinless intelligences of other worlds. Science fiction was also beginning to have an impact on the belief with Jules Verne and H.G. Wells, who published From the Earth to the Moon in 1865 and The War of the Worlds in 1897. Radio play and movie adaptations in the coming century were really having a profound impact on the public. H.G. Wells also authored The Island of Dr. Moreau in 1896, the novel which depicted the experimentation and crossbreeding of humans and animals, something we see commonly done today, but not publicized to the masses. Wells also wrote the lesser known The New World Order in 1940, where he wrote of his desire of a socialist world society where armament should be an illegality everywhere and some sort of international force should patrol a treaty-bound world. And then finally, of course, we've got Charles Darwin, 1809 to 1882, the man responsible for turning an amoeba into a man. His theory of evolution by means of natural selection was revered as the holy grail for cosmic pluralists. Like ancient atomism, it represented a means to an end. The means? How to spontaneously create life. The end? To do away with the Creator. Major changes regarding the belief in intelligent life on other planets were ushered in during the 17, 18, and 19th centuries. What was once an ancient philosophical guess became a mainstream theory. This mainstreaming, though, wasn't the result of one single event, but rather a combination of events in astronomy, heliocentrism, technology, the telescope, and religious thought, paganism, and occult doctrine. By the 20th century, the belief in extraterrestrial life was viewed as a strong likelihood by the fields of astronomy and biology. This persuasion was spearheaded by the growing theory of evolution by means of natural selection. And all of it was based on conjecture, assumption, and man's imagination. This is what the anti-Christian views are all based on, even to this day. Think about it.